again. Uh, this is the last meeting of this week, and uh, we've been looking at the local church, uh, what the local church looks like as we uh, go into the scriptures and as we read uh, in different parts of the scripture, just coming to some understanding of God's plan and God's purpose for the gathering together of his people. We have looked at the description of the church. We have looked at the um, We've looked at the uh, purpose of the church. We've looked at the life of the church. We've looked at priesthood in the church. And tonight we're going to look at another su subject. We're going to look at the lordship of Christ among his people in the church. And then we're going to have a break for a couple of weeks. And then we'll recommence on March the 15th, Sunday night, March the 15th. And we'll look on that occasion at gifts, the spiritual gifts that God gives to the church. And then we'll look the next night, we'll look at different roles in the church the facts that there's, there's bishops and there's deacons and there's male and the female. And we'll just look at the different roles that, that we have to play within the church. Uh, then we'll look at the meetings of the church, the gatherings. What does the Bible say about uh, the, the Christians gathering together? How do we gather and when do we gather and why do we gather? And what's the purpose of our gatherings? And we'll look at the different meetings that we find in the New Testament. And then we'll look at the outreach of the church, the responsibility of the church not only to the Lord and to each other, but the responsibility of the church to the community and the responsibility of the church to the world at large. Uh, and we're going to say that not only should we have a local interest, but we should have a global interest. We should have an interest in men and women in the world at large and their great spiritual need, their need of Christ to be their savior. And then we'll look at discipline in the church. And uh, then later on, uh, on the 22nd of March and then uh, we'll look at stewardship in the church and then finally the next Sunday we'll look at leadership in the church so we thank you for coming we thank you for persisting with us and we trust that you've been blessed and that you will be blessed and helped tonight and in the nights to come in the will of God there's CDs and DVDs on the table at the back uh, just feel free to take whatever you desire either for your own use or for the use of uh, of other people as well. So my subject tonight is Lordship in the Church. Now, I'm just going to read a number of verses to you tonight. Uh, so rather than you jumping backwards and forwards in your Bible, you can just sit and listen to these verses. Because there is one tremendous theme that, that runs through the whole of Scripture, and that is the absolute preeminence of Jesus Christ, the Lord the Lord. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, we read these words. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. This was the part of the first gospel message that was ever preached. Preached in the day of Pentecost by the apostle Peter in Jerusalem. And here is part of the subject, the matter of his preaching. He says, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, know without a shadow of a doubt that God has made that same Jesus the one that they crucified, the one that they spat on, the one that they rejected. God has made that same Jesus both Lord and Christ. What a contrast. Men treated him like a plaything. Men played blind man's buff with him as they wrapped something around his eyes and they said, who smote you? They played games with him. And Peter says, listen, you folks in Jerusalem, I want you to understand that that same Jesus that you mocked and you maltreated, God has made him Lord, sovereign Lord in Christ. And it's the same today. You think of people's attitude towards the Lord Jesus. Think of how men blaspheme his name. His name has been reduced to a swear word that just trips off the end of the tongue. That same Jesus God has made sovereign Lord in Christ. Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, we read these words coming from the lips of Saul of Tarsus, that bigoted Jew, that self-righteous Pharisee, that persecutor of the Christians, that hater of the church, that despiser of the name of Jesus. And he struck blind 
on the Damascus Road, just while he was heading into Damascus to arrest the Christians and to throw them in prison. And suddenly he's blinded with a light from heaven. And he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you hurting me? And Saul suddenly realized that he got it all wrong. All the things that he thought that he was in control of in his life. And he thought he knew and he was, he was focused and, and, a, and a certain way of living, a certain manner of life. And he hated the very name of, Christ, of Christ. And suddenly he realized he'd got it all wrong. And the one that he persecuted or his people he was persecuting was the one that was speaking to him out from the very courts of heaven. And listen to his words. He said, Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? There's a sense in which that really just sums up lord, lordship. That's what lordship is really all about. Saul of Tarsus came to a crisis in his life when he'd realized that he'd messed up, he'd got it wrong. His thinking was all array. He realized that his whole manner of life was sinful, was ungodly. He'd realized that all his religion was of absolutely no value. And he comes to that point of total surrender to Jesus. And he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? I look back over my life and it's all about what I wanted to do. It was all about me doing my own thing, me pursuing my own interests, me giving in to my own intellect and being governed by my own intellect. He says, but now he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm just giving my life into your hands so that your will, your sovereign will, will be fulfilled in me. Listen to these verses in, in, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, that he is Lord of all. You see, when the gospel was preached right at the beginning, it was that Jesus, that Jesus Christ had been made Lord and Christ. And now in Acts chapter 10, we read that he's Lord of all. The absolute supremacy. The total preeminence of the Lord Jesus. That he occupies a place that's above every other place. He sits on a throne that's above every other throne. That he is Lord, supreme, sovereign over all things. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 11. We read these words. That every tongue, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father I wonder this evening does your tongue make that confession to me do you bow in the presence of Jesus Christ Jesus of Nazareth and say I acknowledge you I confess that you are Lord of all Colossians 3 and verse 17 we read these words whatever you do Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And Paul continues in that theme later on in the chapter, and he says, and whatever you do, whatever you do, wherever you are, and whatever circumstances you find yourself do everything heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. You know, if we just grasp the truth of that we verse tonight, that might be enough for us. That might just be enough to radically change our lifestyle from this day onwards. That if we just did everything, everything, as to him. Not just 
doing things before men and to please men and to fit in in with men's ideas and to make us look good before men but just to do everything heartily as unto the Lord to do it for his pleasing knowing that ultimately the one that will reward us is the Lord and knowing that day by day moment by moment we are serving the Lord Christ This great truth of lordship. Giving Christ his proper place. Having right thoughts and a right attitude towards him. Permeates the whole of the New Testament scriptures. Time and time again. He's referred to as the Lord. Jesus. Christ. You know, very, very seldom in the New Testament is... Jesus referred to as simply Jesus. He is referred to Jesus, that name on its own, that name that links him with us, that links him with earth, that links him with his humanity. That was the name that was given him at birth. You'll call his name Jesus. But you know, Jesus is more than just Jesus. He's Christ, he's the anointed one, he's the Messiah, he's the sent one of God. And he's the Lord supreme and sovereign and almighty the Lord Jesus Christ or oh, to have right thoughts about Christ Frank Viola said these words the eternal purpose of God is centered upon the absolute lordship of Jesus Christ the divine focal point is the establishment of the complete sovereignty and supremacy of God's Son, whereby he is given the preeminence over all things. All of God's activities, all of God's movings are towards this end. Hence, the chief work of the Holy Spirit in this age is to establish the absolute lordship of Christ in the universe. He says, accordingly, the Holy Spirit will break down and devastate everything that opposes, that obstructs, that hinders the Lord's sovereign rule in the hearts of his people. In a word, God's ultimate intention is to establish the centrality and the supremacy of his Son over all things, nothing excluded. However, before Christ can be made preeminent over all things, he should have first preeminence among his own people in his own church. What a glorious thought, the purpose of God, that there's coming a day when Christ will fill all things, when Christ will be over all things, when the absolute supremacy and preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ will be known and recognized by all supreme in the universe of God and what Christ will be and acknowledge to be in a day to come he desires to see that acknowledgement among his people here on earth I want to think of two things tonight I want to think of the lordship of Christ in relation to us as individual believers and then I want to think of the lordship of Christ in relation to the church the local church the local fellowship of believers what really happens when a person is saved, when a person gets converted, when a person is born again? You know, there's a lot of different words that are used to describe that moment in a person's life when they come in faith to Christ, when they repent of their sins and they put their faith in the Lord Jesus. There's a whole host of things happen. But one of the things that happens is that their attitude towards Jesus Christ changes. Their attitude towards Jesus Christ changes. You see, when the, in the times of the early church, when the gospel was first preached, there were two opposing cries, particularly among the Jews. And one of the cries that came from the Jews was simply this, Jesus Christ is anathema. He's a curse. 
Hence the crucified them. Hence they just got rid of him. They rejected him. They saw no beauty in him that they should desire him. He was despised. And they esteemed him not. Treated him as the offscouring of the earth. Jesus is accursed. And yet when the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ was preached in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit moved through the preaching. There were people that were pricked in their conscience and they cried out to the preachers, listen, what are we going to do about this message? What are we going to do? We are condemned. We have crucified the Lord Christ. And the answer to the, of the preachers was this, that they needed to repent. And they needed to accept their position before God and accept the provision God had made for them in the death of his son. And that group of people, instead of saying Jesus is anathema, their declaration was Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And that's really the change of attitude that must take place. If there's a real work of the Spirit of God in a person's soul, when they realize their need of Christ, when they realize their need as guilty lost sinners and the fact that Christ has died on that cross, that their sins might be forgiven, they have a change of attitude towards him. And they acknowledge him as sovereign Lord, as supreme. They give him his proper place. And the declaration of their confession of faith and the declaration of their life from that day onwards is the fact that Jesus, the one rejected by men, he is indeed Lord and he's Lord of all. And the fact that Christ is Lord must have a regulating effect upon every area of the believer's life, every area of my life. Every area of your life, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, should be regulated with this amazing truth that Jesus is not only your Savior, but he is your Lord. He is your Master. There must be the acknowledgement of that, that Jesus Christ is supreme. That Jesus Christ is greater than everyone. He's greater than everything. And we gladly bow and acknowledge him to be such in our lives. There needs to be a recognition of who Christ is. And there needs to be a response to who Christ is. Who is he? Who is he? Listen to the words of Paul as he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and 11. This is just one little verse we could pick out. Loads of verses from the scripture. What does Paul say? He says, he's the blessed and only potentate. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Who is he, Paul? Who is he? Who is Jesus? He says he's king of kings. He's lord of lords, king above all kings. Lord above all lords. Supreme preeminent. Sovereign Lord of all. Who is he to you? Who is he to me? Who is he? To the church that gathers in this place. What is our impression? What is our what is our appreciation? Of Christ. Who is he? It's the Lord Almighty. Awesome. Authoritative. Powerful. Oh, that we might grasp in it the greatness and the glory and the majesty of the Lord Jesus. That he's sovereign Lord. And yet being sovereign in wonderful grace, he has stepped into time in order to become our saviour, to give his life a ransom on the cross. And when we recognise him as saviour and sovereign Lord, then we recognise that we owe him a debt. 
that we can only pay by responding to his grace and yielding our lives unreservedly, totally and completely to him for his service down here. You see, the gospel of the grace of God is an awesome message with an awesome effect. It presents to us the greatness of Christ, the glory of Christ, the supremacy of Christ. And as we understand who he is, when we come and receive him by faith, we not only accept the value of his saving work, but we bow to the supremacy of his divine person and we must yield, give our all unreservedly to him. Recognizing, not just singing about Christ as being Lord, but living out in the reality that Jesus is Lord of our lives. Sadly, Someone has said many pastors proclaim from the pulpit a feeble, feel-good message that entices people to just make them feel good. This is the sort of preaching that proclaims Jesus as our buddy and offers a trivial personal relationship with Jesus for some kind of personal fulfillment, liberation, and satisfaction. And you know, that is the message that is preached in many places today. That's the kind of message that is broadcast in the media today. That Jesus is our buddy. That Jesus is there to answer to all our needs. That Jesus is there to solve all our problems. That Jesus is there just to make us feel good. And to minister to us day by day. And praise God, he is a friend. And he does stick closer than a brother. And he is there, but he's, a, he's the supreme, sovereign Lord of all. And authentic Christians must confess him as such and respond by gratitude. Not just resting in an easy believism. Not just resting in the fact that sometime, somewhere in the past, we said a prayer or we made a decision or we signed some sort of card or we made a response to an emotional appeal. But there must be a response to a total commitment to Jesus Christ. A recognition that he is our Lord, that he is Lord over every area of our life. And if we don't do that, if we don't get there, then we don't really get what it means to be a Christian. And we don't really get what it means to be part of a church to those who don't understand the Lordship of Christ and the absolute rights of Christ over every area of life, then church, rather being, than being church, simply becomes a club. That Christian fellowship, rather than being Christian fellowship, fellowship with the Lord Jesus and fellowship with those that belong to him, it becomes nothing more than a social thing rather than a spiritual thing. There must be the recognition of the absolute sovereignty and supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the response to who he is? Well, really, there can only be one response. When we recognize who Christ is, there can only be a response, and that is surrender to him, submission to him, the giving over of all to him. Coming to the point in our life that, that Paul came to, or Saul of Tarsus came to, when we say, Lord, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do, Lord? Now, the reality is that so often we're like the old Saul of Tarsus and we just live to our own agendas. We, we just do the things that make us feel good. We just give in to our own ideas and, and we're led by that. But, you know, the believer in the Lord Jesus, the individual that has recognized who Christ is, has resp the response to him 
is Lord. Lord, what do you want? Here's, here's my life. Here, here it is, Lord. I'm no longer in control of it. I don't want to be in control of it. If I'm controlling my life, then I'll get it all wrong. And so, Lord, I'm asking you to take control. I'm asking you to lead me and to guide me. I'm asking you to do in my life and through my life whatever it pleases you. Whatever it costs, Lord, I'm abandoned to you because you are, Lord, you are sovereign. You are supreme. And I give myself over to you. I recognize you as my master. All my rights are gone. I gladly bow everything. Lay everything before you. I gladly bow in your presence. Way back in the Old Testament, we'll get pictures of that. You know, Simon was talking about that last night, the pictures, the shadows of the Old Testament. You see, it's good to know that when we come into the New Testament, that, that, that the old thing has, has gone away. You know, the old ritualistic thing of, of Judaism, with the temple and the tabernacle and the, and the, priestly, the, the, the priesthood and, and the, the altar and all that kind of stuff. And this, it's all gone away. It's all been superseded by Christ. But in the Old Testament, there's pictures of this whole idea of consecration, giving ourselves over to the Lord. The Bible speaks about the Hebrew servant. And, and there came a point in his experience when his master had to let him go free. But he came to his master and he says, I, I love my master. I don't want to go free. I want to serve him. And I want to serve him forever. You see, that's really where we should be as Christians. You know, people speak about the liberty, the freedom we have in Christ. But it's not a freedom, it's not a liberty to do as we please. It's a liberty to do what he please. It's a taking of our lives and it's a coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I love you. I love you because you're who you are in all your supremacy, in your glory, in your majesty. I stand in awe of you. And I love you for all that you did on the cross for me. I don't want to go out free. I don't want to go out and live my life just to please me. I just want to become your bond slave. I want to surrender all my rights to you. And that man, that servant, was taken out and his ear was, was bored through with, a, with an awe. And everybody looked at him and they knew that he was, the, he was the master's possession. He was the bond slave of the master. I wonder, I wonder are we there as Christians? And I wonder are we just can you hold and still in control of our own lives and still just doing our own thing? Or have we really come to that point and just surrendered everything to the Lord because we love him? I thought there was another wee picture and, uh, and uh, Simon mentioned it uh, last night. Uh, he talked about the, the priest and the day of his consecration uh, in the Old Testament and how that he, he came and sacrifices were made and the blood was put in the, his right ear and the, the, right, the thumb of his right hand and the big toe of his, left, of his right foot. And it was really, he was really saying, I'm now consecrated to God. I'm consecrated to the service of the tabernacle, the service of God. And from that moment onwards, he, he just became a servant, a willing servant, a consecrated, devoted servant to God. The Bible also talks about Nazarites. And these were individuals, and they decided they would make a special vow. And that vow was a vow of consecration, a vow of dedication, a vow of devotion to the Lord and there were certain things marked them marked out as just belonging to him and these are just really pictures of, of what our lives should be like as believers in the Lord Jesus consecrated, devoted, given over entirely to the Lord to do his will and to please him in everything and his will becomes the law of our life and our earnest desire in everything is to please him, to please our master. You know, I remember, I've told this story before, and some of you have heard me, but I remember a number of years ago, I was down at a, a New Year's Eve with a group of Asian believers down in the northeast of England, 
and uh, we spoke from the word of God and then as we got nearer to, to midnight we had a time of prayer and every one of these dear believers male and female alike they got down on their knees on the floor some of them were prostrate on the floor and all the sisters with their, head, their, their heads veiled as they were on the floor and they start, everybody started to pray and one another would come and they would say master master we come before you tonight as your humble servants i've never heard language like that before i've never heard language like that since to be honest it really struck me it never left me not only the reverence of it and the devotion of it but the humility of it and the reality now here were people that recognized the claim that jesus had in their lives that, they, that he was their master and they were his humble feeling servants they took the low place and they certainly gave him the high place in their lives what about you, what about me tonight can we truly say master I come before you as a humble servant desiring just to do your will that you might be glorified in all things I thought about the, the master servant relationship you know that was really where the disciples were wasn't it with their relationship with the Lord Jesus you know they were his disciples they were those that followed him they were those that learned of him you know I thought of things that marked that relationship I can only mention them in passing you know, I thought about respect, respect, and reverence. I wonder, do we really have a respect for the Lord? Do we have a reverence for him? Even every time we mention his name, every time we draw into his presence, every time we read his word, every time that we gather together, do we really just have a sense of reverence, a sense of respect because of who he is? And all the splendor of his being. I thought of submission. I thought of surrender. You know, these disciples had, well, they said to him on one occasion, Lord, Lord, we've given up this for you and we've given up that for you. And they had, they'd given up a lot. They just, they just surrendered everything. You know, Matthew's sitting at his job, counting the, counting the taxis uh, in his little office, and, and Jesus says, follow me, and he just gives it up and follows, and Peter and John are, are, are working away at the nets, and the Lord Jesus says, follow me, and they just left it all and followed. They gave it up for him. Submission, surrender, commitment. You know, does, does that mark us? You know, so often we come into the Lord Jesus and it's, Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And it's all about me and it's all about what I want and what I perceive that I need. And it's all about him giving me and him ministering to me. You know, when these men followed the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't promise them a thing. He just says, follow me. And they said, oh, we'll leave everything for you. There was just a recognition that there was something about him. And they just wanted to be part of it. Well, they didn't know that three years down the line, they were going to be associated with public enemy number one in Jerusalem. That he was going to be hunted and hounded. That he was going to be rejected and despised and crucified. And that their lives would be in danger as well. They never understood that. And you see, when we really yield to the Lordship of Christ in our life, we don't really, we don't really know what's around the corner for us. We don't really know what we're signing up for. These men didn't know what they were signing up for. But at the end of the day, it's a yielding of a life to him. It's a surrendering to him, knowing that he knows best, that he is sovereign, that he'll work out all things. No, we need to do is just follow him. We just need to trust him. He's in control. After all, how do we go on when we're in control? The reality is, when we're in control of our life, our life's not really a very pretty picture to look at, is it? 
better just to come to that point of surrender and giving it all into the control of the Lord Jesus. I was thinking of obedience. I was thinking of obeying the master. Think of serving the master. Just doing the master's will. Just whatever he asks us to do. You know, just, just out of love. If you love me, he says, keep my commandments. Do what I ask you to do. Don't question it. Just do it. I was thinking of learning. Learning. You know, that's really what these disciples were. They weren't just following the Lord. They were learning. You know, it's almost like the, the, the apprentice and the tradesman. And the apprentice is there and he's in the company of the master. And he respects him and he honors him and he's submissive to him because he knows that he knows far more than he does. And he's there in his company just watching and listening and just learning. Learning how he operates. And just want to be like him. You know, if a, if a young apprentice is, is, is put alongside a master craftsman, if the master craftsman is really doing his job well, then he'll create within the heart of that apprentice just a desire just to be like him, just to be able to do things the way he does it. And that's a disciple of Jesus. We just want to be able to do things the way he does it. We just want to be close to him and watch him and learn from him and listen to him so that, so that we can imitate him as we follow him in life. I thought of the tragedy of the failure to recognize his lordship and to bow to his lordship. I thought of the tragedy of just calling Jesus Lord by your lips and our life's been a denial of it. You see, there are many people like that. But that's the Lord Jesus talks about that in Luke chapter 13, doesn't he? He talks about the end times. He talks about the day when the master rises up and shuts the door. There's going to be folks outside and they're going to knock on the door. What are they going to say? They're going to say, Lord, Lord, open up to us. And the Lord says, listen, I, I never knew you. I never knew you. You were the one of mine. You, know, you, you, you never bowed the knee to me. You never acknowledged me. Oh, you spoke. This is, but we, we heard you preaching in the streets and, and we ate and drank in your presence and we did all these things. Lord, we were close to you and we, 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 we were interested in you and we, we really liked you. And we listened to you. I said, I don't know you. Lord, Lord. The Lord Jesus, on another occasion, Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? You don't do the things which I ask you to do. You don't do the things that I say. Why do you call me Lord if you're no beaten off, you're no obedient? Why do you call me Lord when you're still exercising your own stubborn will? Why do you say Lord, Lord when your life is unsurrendered to me? The tragedy. Of speaking forth a word that might convey that we know who he is. But yet our life is a denial of the fact that we've ever really recognized who he is. And given into that. He is indeed sovereign. Lord, how vital it is. Not only to recognize him as Lord, but to respond to him as Lord. And to give our lives totally and utterly over to him we can only mature in our faith by knowing trusting and obeying christ as lord realizing who he is and what he has done for us and then responding by our gratitude our trust our obedience our wholesale surrender to him the lordship of christ in relation to the individual believer now we're going to look for the remaining time at the Lordship of Christ in relation to the local church. But you see, the reality is that if he's not Lord of our individual lives, then how can he possibly be Lord of our community life or collective life? He cannot be Lord in the church if he's not Lord in our hearts and in our lives. 
but he desires to be Lord in his, among his people. In fact, Paul, as he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9, he talks about God being faithful. So Paul's writing to a local church, the church of God, which is at Corinth, and he says, God is faithful because God has called you. Remember, we talked about that. We talked about the, 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 the word for church, the word ecclesia. It's a, it's a people that is called out of something and gathered, gathered around something, called out and gathered together. And so Paul says, God has called you. God has called you out of the pagan darkness. He's called you away from ritualistic religion. He's called you away from your sins. And he's gathered you together into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So lordship should be recognized not only in our individual life, but lordship should be recognized and acknowledged in the assembly, in the local church life. Paul says to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1, he says in relation to, the, to God that he has put all things in subjection under his feet that is under the feet of the Lord Jesus and he has given him as head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The absolute supremacy, the absolute authority of the Lord Jesus over everything that takes place in the church. Christ's authority is the very basis of the church. You know, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 that no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So the church rests on the Lord Jesus. And Simon spoke about that as well the other night. That that is the foundation that everything is built upon. It's built on Christ. Church is God's household built upon the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, Paul tells the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2. And the honor of being the foundation of the church, the chief cornerstone of the church, that honor is reserved to Christ and to Christ alone. And so the church is built or based on Christ founded on Christ. The church is built by Christ. The church upholds Christ. And the church extols and exalts and glorifies Christ. The reason for being of the church is Christ. It was commenced by him. It is based on him. It is centered in him. It is designed in order that he might be glorified as he makes his presence known as Lord among his people. Christ's authority is the basis of the church. Christ's authority is the leader in the midst of the church, as the Lord in the midst of his church. Again, we've thought of the Old Testament, and in the Old Testament, you know, God dwelt in the midst of his people. But he dwelt among his people in a certain place. That place was known as the tabernacle initially in the wilderness and then in, and then in Canaan. And ultimately, it was in Jerusalem in the temple. God's presence was, was located in the holiest of all, in the tabernacle, in the temple of old. But God still has a dwelling place. The Lord has a dwelling place. And the dwelling place is not confined to a building. But the Lord Jesus makes a beautiful promise. He says, where two or three are gathered together unto my name, there am I in the midst of them. What a concept, what a promise. Where two or three are gathered together unto my name, there am I in the midst a sovereign supreme Lord of all his presence in the midst of his people that's the desire of the Lord 
Gather together my people unto myself, he says. He longs to see his people gathered out from the world, out from all the systems of men, just gathered to him, recognizing him for who he is, supreme Lord and sovereign, and bowing to him and acknowledging him and experiencing the reality of his presence in their midst. In the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, right at the end of our New Testament, right at the end of our Bible, you know, we have a, a picture brought before us. John sees a vision. And he sees seven golden camp lampstands. We talked about that on Sunday night. These la golden lampstands were a picture of seven, uh, 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 seven golden lampstands, a picture of seven local churches in different parts of Asia Minor. The church at Ephesus, in Smyrna, Sardis, uh, Thyatira, Laodicea, uh, Philadelphia, and so on. Seven golden lampstands. Seven lights of witness for God in, a, in communities. And as John sees these seven golden lampstands, he sees someone walking in the midst of them. And he describes them. I don't have time to read the description. Read Revelation chapter 1 and see the description of then this one who's walking amidst the seven lampstands, who's walking in the midst of these seven local churches. The awesomeness, the majesty of them. The one that commands respect and reverence and honor, the power and might of him. Where is he? He's walking in the midst of his churches. A sovereign Lord. We can speak about his presence among the churches. We can speak about his perception among the churches. Because as he writes to these various churches, he says this, I know, I know, I know. And that's an awesome thing, isn't it? To think that the Lord is still walking amidst his people. He's still walking around the churches. His presence is there in reality. And his perception is accurate. And he's making his assessment on everything that is taking place within the church, the gathered company of his people. And he writes a letter to these seven different churches and he, he condemns them. And he commends them. He commends them where commendation is needed and where he condemns them where condemnation is needed. I wonder what his message would be to the church in looking like. Because he is here and he is perceiving. He is taking note of everything that is taking place among us. I wonder what his perception would be. Not only his presence and his perception, but there's his pronouncement. Because, as we've mentioned, he then makes known his assessment. He pronounces it. And think of his power. He had power to remove these churches. He says to Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, which is the first one he writes to in Revelation 2. He says, you know, he says, if you don't repent, he says, I'm going to remove your candlestick. I'm going to remove your lampstand. It's not going to be there any moment anymore. He says in relation to the church at Laodicea, he says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. They weren't any hot, they weren't any cold, they were just lukewarm. He says, he says, it's disgusting. Imagine disgusting. Imagine living in a way that disgusts the Lord of the assembly. Imagine living a way, functioning in a way as a church that would cause them to say, I'm just going to take it out of the way. I've got no further use for you. The solemnity of the sovereign Lord, supreme one, walking in the midst of his people. The presence of the Lord Jesus should regulate our attendance at the gatherings of the church. You see, when we gather, we're just no meeting in social capacity. It is good to, 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 to enjoy a time together. It's good to have a bite, of eat, to, a, a bite to eat together. It's good to have a, a drink of coffee. It's good just to talk. You know, that's not the function. That's not the big thing at gathering together. It's to gather not, yes, with one another, but to gather with him, to gather unto his name, to recognize that he is in the midst and that we're there to learn of him. 
and we're there to worship him and to honor him and to praise him, to give to him the sacrifice of our lips, the praise of our hearts. We should regulate our behavior. The the Lord is here. And you know, I should regulate our behavior, not just when we gather together, but but just wherever we are in our everyday life, because there's never a point when we're divorced from the church. You see, I'm always in the church. You know, whether I'm here meeting in the hall, or whether I'm at home, or whether I'm walking up and down the street, or whether I go away on holiday, I'm still in the church. And so wherever I am, as a member of the church, then my behavior should be, rec- should be regulated by a sense of his presence, his lordship, his supremacy, his glory. You know, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, you know, I'm writing these things so that you might know how to behave yourself in the church of God, which is the house of the living God, which is the pillar and ground of the truth. And the presence of the Lord should regulate our attendance. We just want to be there because he's there. Imagine missing a date with the Lord. Imagine the Lord turning up and us absent. Imagine the Lord gathering his people together in order that he might, that he might, that we might learn of him, that we might praise him and serve him and worship him. And we think that we've got something better to do. It regulates our behavior. It regulates our relationships. You know, Paul writes these words in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. There was a wee bit of problem in, in Philippi. And it was a problem. There was people that weren't getting on too well. And there was the spirit of intolerance was coming in among them. And you know, that's the spirit that oftentimes just breaks up relationships, isn't it? That spirit of intolerance. You see, we're all different. Different background, different baggage, and different aspirations. And so often there is these wee conflicts of interest. And Paul says, listen, let your yieldedness be known unto all men. Don't stand your ground in issues that don't really matter. You know, be, be tolerant towards each other. And he says, remember, he says, the Lord's near. The Lord's near. You know, how can we fall out with one another when the Lord's there? When the Lord's really by our hand, when he's just there listening and watching, and so the fact that Jesus Christ is in the midst of his gathered people should regulate our attendance, should regulate our behavior, should regulate our relationships. But we need to give him his rightful place. There needs to be a recapturing in our hearts of the absolute lordship of Christ in his gathering, the gathering of his people, his church. That means that whenever decisions need to be made in relation to church life, in relation to the direction that we go, in relation to the activities that we get involved in, the way we handle issues that arise, there's no place for what we think should be done. There's no place for leaders getting together and saying, this is what we're going to do. This is what we'll agree on. There's place for one thing alone. What does the Lord want in this situation? How is he leading? How is he directing? What is his mind? What is his will? It is his body. It is his church. We are his people. We must bow in all things to him and to him alone. Someone has said for two people to make a decision independent of the Lord constitutes spiritual conspiracy. Conspiracy is a serious offence. It's a jailable offence. And to conspire, to sit down as a group of elders or to sit down as a company of the Lord's people and make decisions without seeking his mind and will is to conspire against him. So in all that we do as a church, then we must seek his face so that all that we do is according to his will 
as he's revealed it in his word. And we do it according to his word. And we do it in order that his approval might be felt among us. Christ alone has the right to rule his own church. It's his body, not ours. All belongs to him. He has purchased us with the costliest price of his precious blood. And so he alone possesses full rights of ownership. And so we need to submit to his lordship practically in every way in our life, individually, and as a church. As we hinted at the other night there, in Christ's lordship, in his Christ, Christ's headship, lies the answer to all of our problems. When Christ has his full and rightful place, when he is recognized as absolute lord over his people, then all of our problems are resolved. Every problem is resolved. You think of Corinth. You read through the first 11 chapters of Corinth. Corinth, that local church at Corinth was a mess. Carnality, there was division, there was envy, there was spiritual stagnation, there was self-absorption, absorption, there was blasphemy, there was pride, there was immorality, there was discord, there was rivalry. What a pitiful picture of a church marked by corruption. And Paul felt aware of all that. What was his answer? He had one solution for it all. Whether it was immorality, or whether it was envy or division, he had one answer. He says in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2, he says, I determined not to know anything else among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says in verse 3 and 11, for there's no other foundation can be laid than that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ alone. Christ the answer to every problem among his people. A recognition of his absolute lordship, that he is the all-wise God. And we bring everything to him, and we wait upon him, and we seek his direction. How does his leadership how does his lordship work through in the local church? Well, it really begins with the study and adherence to the word of God. You know, the, the word of God is not just a, an inspirational book. You know, sometimes that's how we use it, isn't it? We just kind of dig into it in the morning. We dig into the night. We're just looking for a wee bit of inspiration. We're just looking for a wee bit of lift. We're just looking for a wee word that will just cheer our hearts. And, you know, that is good. But, you know, the word of God is more than that. It's, it's the blueprint. It's the operating manual. That God has revealed to us, the Lord has revealed to us how he wants us to live and how he wants us to function as a local church. And so we need, to, we need to value this book and we need to read it. We need to study it. We need to get into it. We need to come to a spiritual understanding of what the Lord is after for his people and for his people here. And not only must we study the word, but in our studying, we must just bring everything to the Lord and seek his face and seek his mind. MacArthur, John MacArthur says, one thing we do more than anything else to answer every challenge to Christ's authority, and that is the restoration of a clear, powerful, expositor, expository preaching in, the right, in its rightful place as the center of all the church's activities. If we truly believe Christ is Lord of the church, then the church needs to hear his voice. His word must be proclaimed and its content taught accurately, systematically, and unrelentlessly whenever the church comes together. The church today is badly in need of reformation. And Christ's lordship over his church is still the central truth that we must recover. And it requires the unleashing of his word among his people again. We cannot merely float along with the latest evangelical trends and expect things to get better. Like Martin Luther, we need to fight for the honor and authority of Christ as Lord of his church. And if Christ is going to be Lord of this church, then we need to systematically read the word. We need to systematically preach the word. We need to seek his face to ask him what he is saying to us through his word what his message for us now, what his message for the church is. Let's just conclude 
I'll just read what I've got here rather than sort of expanding it just because of time. Since Jesus is Lord of the church, head of the church, foundation of the church, and the center of, the gather, of, of gathering in the church, then he ought to be recognized as such by every gathering of believers and every believer who gathers. The desire of each local church should be to operate as those who are ruled directly by the Lord Jesus. The church should see him who is invisible by faith. It should be able to turn by prayer and supplication to him for guidance, just as we do for individual guidance. Leaders should operate under the one true leader, the chief shepherd of our souls. The church's accountability must be directly to Christ, not to some central council or governing body. The local church may work together with other churches, but it must be responsible directly to the Lord for its own condition and practices. The understanding of Christ's headship in all matters of spiritual life can make real the concept that we are more than just co-members of the same religious group, but rather we are fellow heirs, fellow members, fellow partakers with the Lord himself as those who have been made alive together. Christ is our life. Christ is our Lord. Christ surely is willing to be the active ruler in our midst if we look to him to do this. Then we can become a functioning monarchy rather than a pretended democracy. God's aim in this hour is for us to make Christ's lordship in a, pract a practical reality in our churches as well as in our personal lives. Such a way, however, is truly costly. It's a hard thing to yield our rights over to the Lord, to wait on the Lord, and to put the absolute rulership, authority, and decision-making rights into the hands of the Holy Spirit. It tests whether or not we are going to put our hands on things, or whether we are going to yield all rights to Christ. Therefore, may we give Christ the centrality and the supremacy in our hearts corporately as well as individually so that he might have the preeminence over all things. God desires to sum up all things in his Son. All that originates out of ourselves will not last. Only that which comes out of Christ can find God's highest blessing. Even now the Lord is awaiting his people to give him that place of preeminence among themselves. Let us then in reality make Christ the Lord over all things, the head over all things to the church, nothing excluded. May we yield to his lordship and Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we just commit to you the word that's been spoken again tonight, and we just pray that you would search our hearts, challenge our hearts by the Holy Spirit, our God, impress these truths upon every one of our lives. There may be some, our God, and have never ever acknowledged Christ as Lord and Saviour, that they still blaspheme his name, they still count the Lord Jesus Christ as a, as a, as a nobody. They've never yet yielded. They've never yet bowed. Oh God, may they tonight bow to him, recognizing who he is and appreciating all that he's done. And our God coming to him and saying, Lord, what do you really want me to do? And our God, if some of us have been there and we've drifted away from there and we've taken back control of our lives and we're still doing what we want to do rather than what he wants us to do, Lord, bring us to repentance tonight. And we just pray, Father, that once again that we would just surrender everything into it his hands, not only as an individually, but as a church, as a local community of Christians here in Ockham Lake. We just desire that Christ may be honored, that Christ may be glorified, that all that is done in this place would just be marked by the reality of the Lord Jesus in our midst, and that we would bow to him in every single area of church life. So we do commit ourselves to you. We just pray that over these incoming days, until we meet again, that you would just watch over us. We just pray you would continue, our God, to reveal yourself to us and that even in the quietness of our own hearts and our own homes, that we would just know what it is for you to draw near to us and us to draw near to you and for us just to have deep personal dealings with you in our lives. We ask these things as we acknowledge in your presence right now that Jesus Christ is. He is Lord.